Hello everyone, I am Rajesh Isan Gupta and we will be continuing on our module 2 and the week 2 and that is on the architecture. And so we have been looking at the basics of uh, Buddhist and Jain architecture and so far we have covered uh, some of the basic characteristic features of Buddhist architecture and we have also looked into some of the aniconic and iconic features of Buddhist culture and architecture in the last few lectures. So today we will be looking into uh, some of the other aspects aspects and a specific dynasty and their impact on the development of Buddhist art and architecture in the Indian subcontinent. So today's discussion will be starting with the Mauryan dynasty in the northern part of India and their um, lasting impact on the spread of Buddhism as well as the art and architecture. So the Mauryan uh, dynasty we find that was that ruled parts of the northern India with their uh, with their capital city as Patliputra or today's Patna in the state of Bihar and uh, Mauryan dynasty uh, ruled the part of Indian subcontinent between 4th and 2nd century BC and the peak of the Mauryan dynasty we find that that reached during the time of Emperor Ashoka and we have uh, an image of the map uh, in the right side of the of our uh, in the left side of our screen where we find that I mean there is a map that shows the extent of um, uh, Emperor Ashoka's kingdom and that had uh, that shows something about how far his uh, political boundaries and the reach of his uh, preaching of dharma went up to and that is something that happened during the 2nd century in the 3rd century BC and the entire Indian subcontinent almost the entire Indian subcontinent we can say that came under one particular person's rule and that was been made possible by Emperor Ashoka and this kind of uh, advancement in terms of like I mean bringing all the different territories of South, uh, South Asia under one person's rule was not possible until the Mughal rule in the 16th and 17th century. So we are talking about the 3rd century BC and that was the time when the entire almost the entire Indian subcontinent came under one person's rule and that is Emperor Ashoka. So Emperor Ashoka had a really interesting trajectory of his career. So he started um, so he started his career as a as a warlord, and we see that I mean how he had also um, extended the uh, the boundary of his kingdom uh, further and further by warfare and so on. And after the war of this famed war of Kalinga, he had renounced this. And then he embraced Buddhism after looking at the uh, disasters caused by war. And that is the time we find that when uh, Ashoka was became uh, an important figure in the spread of Buddhism as well as uh, uh, following the path of the Buddha. So, if this is one of the things that we find that that had happened, but also interestingly that I mean with Ashoka's uh, renouncing of uh, this, this political warfare and so on, we do not really see that I mean he had given up on his kingdom or we do not see that I mean he had given up on the army or the people who are, who are very much required for running an entire state. So, what we see that came up as a very interesting part of his this new idea of Dhamma Vijaya or this victory with a religion or like I mean it is not you know a victory which, which is associated with warfare but with the help of uh, spreading Buddhism. So what happened for that we find that in the various parts of his uh, kingdom he had started installing different edicts and the edicts were made on uh, the, the stone surfaces in different places and wherever the stones were not available we find that he had uh, installed this capital or or the, or the pillars and the this this pillars what we find today and we, which are famously known as the ashokan pillars so those pillars became synonymous with uh, ashoka's embracing of buddhism and spreading the path of righteousness which was preached by gautama buddha so we find if we see the map in the left side of our screen, we find that uh, there are many of the sites where the Ashokan rock pillars and edict those are actually found. So one can imagine that I mean those are 
around the borders or like I mean different important parts of his kingdom. So he did not really as I have said that he did not really renounce everything and became a monk like Buddha himself but he was very much the emperor but he did not go for the warfare to extend his kingdom. Instead he, uh, uh, he opted for this new way of um, having his control over the entire territory and that is by uh, preaching the different um, lessons from Buddhism. And for that reason what we find that there are many of the important Buddhist sites uh, as well as the different trade sites and the, the frontiers of his, of his kingdom where we find there are those Ashokan edicts and Ashokan pillars. So for example if we see that I mean some of the pillars and the pillars are carved out of this Chunar sandstone and Chunar being uh, in uh, today as we can see that I mean Chunar is part of um, eastern Uttar Pradesh which is not that far from the city of Pataliputra or Patna. So and that is that is also a place which has historically been known for its sandstones. So we find that in various sites Ashoka had uh, commissioned this Ashokan pillars, this mighty Ashokan pillars which are made from this Chunar sandstones. So what we find that I mean this sand, uh, these pillars which are installed in the various places, one of the pillars we have in the right side of our screen and in here what we find that the pillars are vertical, that they are symmetrical and uh, the, the cylindrical pillars they are slightly tapered and then um, the, the entire the shaft, the shaft which we can see here is made from one piece of stone. And on the top of that there is this capital. So the capital has abacus and where we find that there is an inverted lotus and then on the top of that there is a circular base and on the, on the top of that we usually see there are some of the animal motifs which are found. So we are looking at a pillar that is from the Lorya Nandangar in Bihar and this of course this comes from 3rd century BC and in this one what we find that I mean the animal which is carved on the top of this uh, pillar that is a highly in naturalistic uh, way and uh, it is also believed that on the top of that perhaps there was a will, the will of law which was installed on the top of it. So it's here. So and the will which is also very much important in the idea of Buddhism because um, that is the Dhamma Chakra or like I mean the will of law and we, it is believed that I mean uh, Buddha had turned the will of law when he preached for the first time in the in the site of Sarnath which is close to the city of Varnasi. So uh, that is the reason we find this particular will became a very important symbol in the art and architecture of the Buddhist art and architecture. And of course Ashoka we find that I mean why he had appropriated this will of law and that is because he had spoken about righteousness and in his edicts as well as in his pillars we find there are inscriptions which speak about the righteous path for all the citizens and for the people whoever are there in, in uh, who are inhabiting his kingdom right. So the, those for those reasons what we find there is that those um, the script the script which was uh, uh, comprehensible to, to the general audience such as Brahmi, Pali, Kharoshti, those were the ones which were opted for and this, this uh, the ideas about the righteous path as well as the importance of Dhamma or like I mean the importance of Buddha's laws and preachings, those were communicated by uh, the script which was written on these pillars as well as by this uh, chakra which was uh, in installed perhaps on the top of these animal motifs which were placed at the at the capital part of, of this of these pillars. We also find that I mean this capital uh, this pillars uh, how, how these pillars are not just there as, as separate entities in the in the middle of nowhere but they were perhaps been associated with the other architectural um, uh, elements as well. So in some cases we find that I mean those, those uh, pillars and those edicts were installed at the major crossroads or the places which are important for uh, the people in those neighborhoods. And in other click cases we also find those uh, pillars they, they also marked a particular sacred territory. So for example what we find here 
that I mean there is this Ashokan pillar we have on screen and that is from Kolhua near Baishali in Bihar and here what we find here is that there is a there is a stupa there is a stupa which we have already studied the significance of this hemispherical shape um, structure where there uh, where uh, the relics of uh, Buddha or um, a symbolic relic of Buddha can be kept. So, we see there is this stupa which is there in Kolhua near Vaishali and in, in front of that we have this lion pillar. So, similar to the one we have seen in Lorianandangar and some of the other places what we find that I mean the, the pillars they usually follow a kind of uh, um, a kind of template how the body of the pillar is constructed and then the lotus as, as a base for the animal motif that, that comes on the top of it and then like the execution of the animals. In some cases we find that the animals are much more naturalistic, in some cases we find the animals are slightly more stylized. So, this kind of variations we find but I mean those are definitely dependent on the context on in which the pillars are erected and where this pillars are erected. So, this is what we find a very peculiar architectural characteristic that came up during Ashoka's time period. And also if I can go back in the previous lecture, we have also seen how um, the, the Vajrasana which marked the place where Buddha attended enlightenment uh, uh, beneath the Bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya. So, that was also another seat uh, and uh, perhaps another temple site which was erected by um, Ashoka there. So, those are some of the issues that we find that Ashoka had uh, addressed and how all this different kind of architecture building, making sculptures and pillars, those were part of his spreading of Buddhism. And he had in the later times we also find that he had also sent ambassadors not only to different parts of the Indian subcontinent, but also to today's Sri Lanka and part of Pakistan, part of China. Of course, Pakistan was part of like the Indian subcontinent that time and then also to China, to Southeast Asia and so on. And that is how we find that this was also the time when uh, 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 under Ashoka's supervision uh, the saplings of the Bodhi tree from Bodh Gaya was transported to different sites and um, some of the uh, very important Buddhist text for example, Mahavamsa and so on from Sri Lanka today we find that there are the narratives that addresses this account when uh, Ashoka and his and um, the other members of, of his family and, and the royal court how they have facilitated the, um, the transportation of the sapling of this sacred Bodhi tree from, from Bodh Gaya to the island of Sri Lanka and that is how the sacred sites in Anuradhapura and so on those places were established. So, this is one thing we find that how Ashoka had been proactive in terms of spreading the teaching of Buddhism and that is perhaps one of the reason that we find that I mean why he had also been very important in terms of uh, understanding the politics and the the responsibilities of a ruler, responsibilities of a successful ruler and responsible ruler. So, for those reasons what we also find that I mean there is this one particular capital that comes from the uh, site of Sarnath which we have already discussed that that was the place where uh, Gautama Buddha or the Shakyamuni he preached the law or his idea um, uh, about this new religion for the first time which is very close to the city of Varnasi. So, uh, that was the site uh, in the deer park and w w it, it also to mark this place, to mark this, this very important site uh, in the Buddhist history, we find that Emperor Ashoka had, um, inst uh, I mean uh, he had erected a stupa, this memorial stupa and of course, I mean there might have been more structures which were built by uh, Emperor Ashoka. Now, most significantly I guess I mean we can say there was this another pillar which was erected at this site and that is this Sarnath lion capital what we find there today. So, of course, that I mean uh, the way it had been found from the archaeological excavations in the 19th century, we do see that I mean the capital is found, but I mean it was not attached to the 
to the shaft which was it uh, which originally would have been attached to this uh, particular capital. However, what significantly what we find here in this particular capital is this there are um, the four lions and the four lions instead of like I mean one animal that we have seen in the other um, capitals for example, the one near Vaishali or the one in Lorya Nandangar. What we find here there are four animals and all of them are stylized lions and those animals are uh, they indicate to four directions. So, and then what we find that I mean they, they are uh, standing on this elaborate uh, pedestal and on this pedestal there are four chakras and uh, those those chakras it is believed that I mean those chakras would have been much smaller in scale uh, in comparison to uh, the chakra that would have been there on the top of the lions like for example, here if you can imagine there was a chakra. So, what we have here that I mean there are those um, those four wheels that we find that I mean each are also aligned with each of these lions and then there are those four animals that we have on this pedestal. So, for example, there is a lion, there is this bull, there is a horse and an elephant and so on. So, it is believed that I mean that uh, these animals they also have something to do with this political territory like I mean how each of these directions or each of the areas under his, his kingdom would be identified with these animals. So, that is how it is believed that how he had perhaps uh, thought about uh, having these animal representations in the pedestal. Now, if we see how the entire pedestal is carved, it is three dimensional, it is free standing in one way and then all the details are carved in high relief. So, for example, the lions are uh, certainly carved out of the matrix, they are not being supported by anything else but the structures of the lions in both the I mean in all four sides. And in the pedestal we find that I mean the images of the chakras they are projecting out of the stone matrix and then there are the very naturalistic representation of all these animals which are there in the pedestal. So, for example, if we have uh, the bull and the horse they are represented, they have been represented there with all possible details and uh, the anatomical proportions have have been taken care of and with all the other details for example, the horn or like the horse's hair and all the swelling of the muscles, the different carbs of the body and everything else. So, that is how we know how one animal is distinguished from the other and it also gives a sense of the artistry during this time period. And what are the other things that we find in this particular sculpture is that the uh, of course, they stylized um, the lions and these lions that we find that I mean they, they are majestic and um, their hair and everything those, those have been used almost as a pattern. So, that I mean there is a difference between the plain uh, skin that, that is shown in terms of their legs, their paws and their face and then how that is contrasted with the hair that we have here with the lion and also that I mean all the other uh, details in their face as well as uh, the expression and the eyes and everything those have been done with utmost care and that is the reason why we find that I mean these lions almost come to life even though they are um, to some extent stylized. Now, this particular lion capital why it has such importance and that is because that it perhaps talks about the uh, this four direction and the spread of dhamma or the righteous path. So, this this message which is uh, embedded in it is that I mean how a kingdom that uh, the four directions of the kingdom or all sides of a kingdom or a country needs to have the rule righteousness for having a stable uh, way of living. So, that is the message that we find to be part of this particular uh, line capital and that is the reason we also find that I mean why this particular um, why this particular motif or why this particular sculpture from Sarnath 
was uh, was elected as this new symbol of the Republic of India in the year of 1950. So, uh, and this idea of Ashoka's uh, embracing of Buddhism and the righteous path and of course the spread of Dhamma or the righteous path in all directions that made a huge impact in terms of how we understand the workings of a republic country such as India. So that is the reason why we find that this particular capital which was made in the 3rd century BC and that is around 2300 years from today that still holds much relevance in terms of our understanding of a nation, our understanding of the righteous path and behavior. That is the reason we also find that Ashoka's contribution to, to uh, making these structures as well as um, uh, Ashoka's contribution to the spread of Buddhism cannot be denied even today. So from there, I also wanted to address something else, and that is the uh, the this particular way of handling material that we find in the Mauryan context. So here we have a particular uh, figure which is either identified as a chauri bearer or a yakshi and that was found from this area of Didarganj near Patna and now this is kept in Patna in the government museum. So this is another, this is a, a sculpture that we find, it's a, it's a near life size sculpture of a woman and that we find that I mean she holds a fly whisk in her right hand in a way that I mean it perhaps shows that I mean she is serving either a royal or perhaps a deity. And that is the reason it is uh, her identity has been uh, not very clear whether she is a Yakshi figure who also make their frequent appearances in the Buddhist sculptures. They they usually are placed in the in the both sides of uh, the important uh, important figures like Buddha or the Bodhisattvas. And they can also be part of the they can also be part of the sculptures which which are in the royal palace complex now since we speak about the royal palace complex it is also been believed that during this time period most of the royal palace complex and the important structures were made of wood there are some of the accounts that we find from the Buddhist sources as well as from the uh, from the travelers account who had visited from China and so on and they have uh, profusely they have they have uh, written about how there are uh, these wooden structures these wooden platforms and wooden palaces magnificent wooden palaces which were there in the city of Pataliputra and few other places so it is also believed that I mean the during uh, natural disasters and of course if a fire breaks out then the wooden structures are usually been damaged at the no time and that is the reason we do not really have any of the remnants of those times of these wooden structures. However, those accounts help us to know that I mean there had been this kind of structures in the past in these places and the Indian artisans they have mastered the craft of uh, building uh, with wood and uh, making different kind of decorations and different kind of manipulations on wood. Now coming back to this particular sculpture that we also find that I mean this is also made on sandstone like the uh, like the other structures that we have uh, studied so far like the lion capital and the capital in Sarnath and so on. So these are some of the ones that we find from the uh, which, which are made from sandstone from the Chunar area and, and neighboring areas. Now something is really significant here is this particular kind of polish. So this particular kind of polish that we find is typical to the Mauryan sculptures and the Mauryan pillars which is not uh, seen in the sculptures from the later times as well as the times which were there uh, before um, uh, as well as the sculptures which were there before the Mauryan time. So this is uh, very characteristic of the Mauryan time uh, sculptures and so on and what we find here is this, the, this uh, sandstone sculptures are polished to such an extent that they become uh, shiny as marble. 
So, these cultures and these structures whatever the remnants we have it is a lot of times they have been confused with uh, whether they were made with marble or something else and later on it had been found out that I mean of course, these are made with sandstone, but this polish has been extraordinary something that we perhaps still do not understand today and this kind of polish we do not really see being continued in the later time period. Now, apart from the polish what else we find in this uh, in this sculpture here and that is this uh, this life size or near life size sculpture of this woman whom we find who can be identified either as a yakshi or as an attendant figure she has uh, she 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 is been shown as almost like an ideal woman which is uh, described in the, uh, the contemporary uh, literary sources and so on so what we find here is that i mean there is this soft and rounded modulation of the face and the skin of hers which is contrasted by the way the textiles are been produced so the softness of the skin is con contrasted by the folds of the drapery that is there in the lower half of her body especially this sash which we can see all the folds and how that uh, flows from her waistline also the in terms of the um, the utilization of the ornaments and so on that there we find that the ornaments are also treated differently from the way the fabric is treated or like the way the polished skin is treated so these are the kind of differences that we find being uh, implemented in the sculptures and something that also gives us a sense of the high degree of details high degree of observation as well as their implementation in the sculptures which uh, the, the Mauryan artisans the stone carvers had mastered and uh, there are the views the, the profile view the back view and the frontal view of the sculpture here on screen just for us to have a sense of how the sculpture has been uh, carved from all this um, you know all these different viewpoints and uh, every possible detail has been added to them so that uh, this is something that we can imagine that this is not a sculpture which was made as a relief sculpture which will be stuck to a wall, but it is a freestanding sculpture something like the capitals we have studied so far.